Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. The George Bryan, I am so stoked to have you on the Soul Seeker podcast, my brother. I was on your podcast at the time of this recording, I'd say a few weeks, maybe a month ago, and we had such a good time recording. And now I get to interview you. The tables are turned. George, in just one word, how would you say you're feeling in this moment? Peaceful. Peaceful. Ooh. Yeah, we're going to unpack that peaceful because that's a little bit of what we are talking about uh, before we hit record. So for anyone that's brand new to you, imagine you just are meeting them in the elevator and you just had a few minutes to introduce yourself. How would you introduce yourself? Uh, a highly, highly skilled man who learned everything to succeed through making every mistake and walking through every shadow imaginable well, not picking up the phone when God called the first time or second time or 10th time, knowing that I needed massive, massive breakdown around me to fully surrender into my heart. And in that became a beautiful man where I help and inspire people to put the heart back into their business and marketing. And it just happens to be the best strategy and tactic in the world. And it's created massive success for those around me and myself as well. And I spend every waking moment of my life trying to serve and support people and teach them that relationships beat algorithms because I feel like we're in a world where it's getting further and further lost and disconnected from the entire reason that we're here. And so for me, business is a way to connect with people, not to convert or transact with people. And it allows us to make a massive impact on the world. And so I spend every waking moment trying to be a lighthouse. That's beautiful. Thank you for that. There's so many different threads that I would love to go down. I wrote down uh, when God picked up the phone and you didn't answer it the first times. And that's something that we're going to unpack in just a second here. But before we do, just so people have like a, a better understanding of who you are, like some humble brags, you were 22 weeks, number four bestselling author on New York Times, right? Like what, what else? Let's uh, yeah. show the resume a little bit. Some of these humble brags. Uh, okay. This is the part I hate. So we'll just get it out of the way. Um, yeah, right. So yeah, I was a, you know, I, I'll, I'll give context. Um, I, I tell people I'm only successful because I'm stupid. And what I mean by that is I was a Marine for 13 years and, and I plan on spending 30 years of my life in the Marine Corps. And I got medically separated after giving one too many enemies award badges for me getting hurt. And, you know, God and, and my life had a different direction. And then I taught myself how to cook um, to beat my bulimia and my eating disorders because I was bulimic my entire life from 15 on, including my active duty Marine Corps career. It's how I dealt with pressure and stress. And uh, so two years after learning how to cook and starting a blog, I was a 22 week New York Times bestseller and never written a book did all the photography myself. And then someone's like, you should launch an app. And I was like, I'll figure that out too. And then 2015, I launched an app and hit the number one health app in 2015 by Apple. And then built about a million social media followers, 6 million people organically a month on my website within three years. I've never spent a dollar in paid media in my own company, but now I've helped over a hundred companies scale uh, to seven, eight, nine, and 10 figures. I've helped two exit for a billion. And, uh, I've consulted some of the biggest names, biggest companies in the world and been the Oz behind the curtain to help them love their customers and do it. So 
things like taking a supplement company from a million a month to 2 million a day in 18 months, or having clients that just left my office who were doing 30 grand a month and within three months hit hundred K months over and over and only by keeping them aligned and in their heart. And so I'm blessed to have lived the life that I've lived and, and sat on every side of it. And, and I feel like the biggest thing, and I don't talk about this often, but I don't like the humble brags because a lot of people don't recognize that every one of those were byproducts of addictions or me running away from something, right? Like I, I didn't mm. set out to be a New York times bestseller. Entrepreneurship was my new addiction when the opiates were hitting and I was addicted to that and dealing with PTSD. And so I put my energy anywhere I could and worked, you know, 22 hours a day, like tirelessly like a slave and then everybody celebrates it. And so it's, it's one of those really, really interesting things that I'm so proud of them now. And I look back at it in hindsight and, and I'm like, it's amazing, but also the lessons were the only reason they happened is because it was never about the result. It was always about the process. And because I didn't have it in my brain to, oh, I'm going to do this or I'm going to achieve this. I focused on the intentionality and integrity of the inputs and, and I put people at the forefront of all of it. And so, yeah, there's, there's a lot of accolades in there that, you know, I could even keep going, but I, I think the most important part is just, uh, you know, they're always byproducts. And so I love them, but they don't define who I am. I'm not a New York times bestselling author. I'm not a entrepreneur who scaled these companies. Like I'm George, like I want to be an incredible father. I want to be an incredible friend. I want to be an incredible partner to my ex-wife. I want to be an incredible human to everybody. I meet, I meet yourself included who graced me so presently on my podcast. And I've gotten so many messages about your breath and your modalities that everybody loved. And so like, I feel like when you focus on the right things and I spent most of my life bleeding on people because other people cut me and I have an entire lifetime left to make up with that with love. And so that's what I try to focus on now. No, there's so much of me that's like the business side of me that wants to like go down that rabbit hole of like asking all these business questions. But to your point of the accolades and being in the process, I find that for me, like that's kind of my old habits of being a workaholic that kind of go there. And where I get stuck is in that energy. And I think what would be most helpful, because I have a good idea of the listeners of this podcast, many people listening are in the thick of a career transition. So what's really helpful, helpful for the humble brag is to understand that like you're talking about relationships beat algorithms, but it's not because you're a flowery hippie or spiritual or you recently revisited God. It's because you have gnosis, you have felt experience and lived it. And I'm just like you where it's like, hey, I don't really want to brag about myself or when someone else is like introducing me on a podcast or on stage or whatever i'm kind of like oh i'm like i get imposter syndrome or whatever comes up or i don't want to seem like a narcissist uh, mm -hmm. but at the same time it's so important because it establishes that credibility and now it's like our ears perk up and it's like oh george is talking about relationships over algorithms and he's qualified to talk about that because he actually had an app that was number one which includes algorithms right yep. so yep. yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> That's the only reason why, because uh, thanks, man. I appreciate and I, that. And so. I love it. And I want to, I want to give a reframe because I've been, I have a lot of my one-on-one -on -one clients. They have the same thing. They're like imposter syndrome, imposter syndrome. Like, I don't want to be a narcissist. I was like, listen, the fact that you say that means it's impossible that you are one. But the second part is, it's not imposter syndrome. It's that you care about your message being received, that you care about the people in the audience. I would be concerned if you walked on stage and were like, oh, how are they going to perceive me? And not that it should allow us to change, but to always have empathy and understanding for who is in the audience and who we're speaking to, to make it about a mutually beneficial thing. Like, I think that muscle that most people label imposter syndrome is actually caring, like having values and standards and thinking about the results that people are going to get. Like, it's the first thing I look for with people. And I'm like, oh, you have imposter? Great. We're going to win because you care. Like you're so self-aware of like how your message is received. You're just not seeing it the right way. So I love that. Hmm. I, lo I love reframes in general and that one as well. And what helps too for me is uh, focusing on like the one person type concept. Yep. And like if there's one person, I just got done delivering my first workshop or presentation for the new book, Overcoming Overwhelm, which was the six step breath process I share on your podcast. Yep. I've done a bunch of podcasts and interviews on it, but it was the first presentation and it was on Zoom. Like I literally finished it about 30 minutes before hitting record on this. And there was 
80 people on there, only two left by the end of the hour long uh, presentation and doing presentations. I'm sure, you know, like it's, it's one thing in person. Like I love mm -hmm. uh, co-creating with that energy, but on zoom where you're just talking to yourself, it's so uncomfortable, right? Oh, it's a muscle, man. I've literally done thousands of them and I have tricked myself in every which way in the book to, to, to be there and to be able to do it. Even, even solo podcasts, right? Like I was joking about this on my podcast the other day. And I was like, do you know how hard it is when there's nobody in my office and I'm just staring at the mountains? I'm like, all right, I'm going to have this conversation with myself to all these people who I love, but the only echo chamber is me. And I'm like, Oh my goodness. Like I've, I've figured out every hack in the book and when I'm really in it, I have my CEO, Ashley jump on zoom in the back. And I'm like, Hey, I just need you to be an audience and I'll just call random friends. And I used to do that in the beginning. I'm like, I'm recording the show for everybody, but I just need to see your facial reactions. Like I just need to see some level of animation or humanity. And so even when I do virtual ones, like I have rules and I'm like, your video has to be on or else you can watch the replay because if I'm here, you're here. Right. And I want to be able to connect with people. And so, yeah, dude, I totally feel that all day. And that, that selfishly, that's a good uh, reframe for me because I, I'm pretty good at like the solo cast now, um, you know, but it, for me to think about webinar, like it's doing a solo cast is going to help me so much for those online ones. So I appreciate that. But getting back to the audience though, knowing that a lot of people are in career transitions. I mean, man, so many first time, I'm entrepreneurs, you know, it's so accessible these days. Like what would be some tips? I know you laid some out, but just to yeah, hit them yeah. again for first time entrepreneurs that are making or, or not even first time entrepreneurs, but any sort of career transition. Yeah. I, I actually love this question. No one's ever actually really ever asked me this question and I get interviewed a lot. Uh, I'd say my number one piece of advice is never allow your identity to get wrapped up in the work that you do. You are a completely separate whole and complete person that's choosing a path, you're choosing an avenue, you're choosing a bridge, whether you're a coach or a physical products person, or you're going to launch a business or be a part of the team. It's an outfit that you put on, but it's not who you are at your core. And I think that's probably one of the biggest things that I help entrepreneurs with, especially like ones that come at the six and getting stuck at the seven figure level. It's because everything is so intrapersonally connected that it gets in the way of clarity, right? And, and the way that I like to frame entrepreneurship is that like, we're like a $50 million quarterback that's been drafted. And in that game, no matter how much you pay a quarterback, they're not going to win every game. They're not going to complete every pass. They're not going to execute every play. But when they watch film and when they get feedback, they don't take it personally. They take it as improvement, knowing that they can always improve, but not because it's their identity. It's because of a job that they're choosing to do. And I think that that's probably one of the biggest, biggest ones because it's so easy to get lost in the weeds and like, oh, I did a post and nobody watched it or they left a negative comment or they did blank, like I'm a bad person. And whether we vocalize it externally or not, we live in a pretty tainted world where there's a lot of beliefs that are either taught or caught that stick around, right? And even when you empty them out, that cup is getting poured into every single day. But the reason it's so dangerous is because every time one of those pieces of evidence comes in, it creates rumination and stagnation. And there's no such thing as stagnation. There's either growth or death, right? That's why I tell people the devil's in the details. Because when you're up here, you're not here and you're not taking action. The story that we're believing to be true is the one that's actually preventing the new result or the new seed to be planted, which would be the evidence needed to disprove that story, right? And I, I say this, and, and I, I have the incredible pleasure of being friends with some of the most successful people in the world on paper. And there's one common conversation that we always have. And the longer I'm in this game, because we're going on almost 15 years now, is we all joke that we are only successful because we have literally done everything else wrong. Like everything. Like, you know, I talk about it so eloquently and like, oh yeah, I was a food blogger. And then I was this. Well, yeah, you missed the point where my wife was eight months pregnant. She was, we were three weeks away from bankruptcy and I drank ayahuasca and met God for the first time. And I decided to give away the entire company with nothing to stand on and then spent three years off the internet, changed my phone number, changed my email, was 120 pounds overweight and was literally in the valley of the shadow of death. 
trying to find my identity every single day and worked like a dog to become a consultant and to figure out where that was, right? Like the highlight reel is not the real story. That's another reason I don't like talking about it because I'm like the highlight reel is not the real results, right? Like they're the results of the 99 failed swings, but the only time you lose is when you stop swinging. And really that's where most clarity comes from. And for me, I've always been the guy because of how I grew up, like not having access to things and homeless at 13 and like self-sustaining and then going into the Marine Corps was like, if I'm going to learn something, the only way I learn is by kind of smashing my head through the wall with a helmet on. And then eventually it hurts enough where I'm like, oh, don't go down that road again. But the amount of experience that you pick up is is absolutely mind blowing. And, and I feel like one of the biggest things that happens is everybody stops before they ever get to a point where the result could come or the clarity could come. And really in the game of entrepreneurship, the moment you think there's a finish line, you've already lost the game because there isn't one, right? Like even when I define marketing for people, I'm like marketing is guessing and testing until a test works, knowing you better have five guesses in the queue because it's going to stop working instantly, right? There is no set it and forget it. Like the infomercials lied to you for your dinner conversations with Ron, the kitchen convection machine. It's really about what you choose to do every single day and also falling in love with delayed gratification because mm -hmm. that's what entrepreneurship really, really is. And, and we, we live in a world now where everybody is so instantly gratified, right? Like you can open your phone and get an instantaneous feedback loop on anything instantly, but then we measure in days while we're trying to build impact in decades and we wonder why we never get there. Because if we literally change our direction every single day, we never end up down the road that we set out to end up on. And so it's very, very important that you have a sense of self as a player, not as you are the result of that play, so that you can also make adjustments while protecting the inputs, right? Like Matthew McConaughey talks about this in his book, Green Lights, oh, I, and I love it. Yeah, I absolutely love it, right? And I recommend everybody get the, the physical one. I know everybody loves that he narrates it, but the physical one, he has actual photos of his journals mm. and of his kid pictures and like everything in there. And it changes the experience. It's very visceral. But he's literally like, I don't even get an award for a movie until I've filmed two more because if you're attached to that result, it's not going to come. And I even used to teach this when I was a marksmanship instructor, right? Like when you shoot a pistol and you're looking at the sights, if you want to hit the target, the front sight post has to be in focus and the target has to be blurry. And the moment you look at the target, you actually miss what you're aiming for. And so results and success are a byproduct of your intentionality and your inputs to create a result. And all too often we let the noise get in the way we either stop acting or we just keep going in the wrong direction because we're taking it personal and we're not looking at like what can change, right? And it's not big swings. It's not home runs. It's base hits over and over and over again, right? And it's understanding that the more successful you become, the louder the noise gets. And, and my friend Alex Sharfin says this better than anybody. And he's like, you don't have the business you want because you haven't become the person to run it. And what he means by that is not that you don't have the skills, it's that you don't have the capacity to deal with the noise and make informed, impersonal decisions, filter out what doesn't matter and focus on what does so that you can create the result. And so for me, like that would be the advice I would give to myself 15 years ago because it would have saved me so many headaches. So, so much there. Thank you. And I hope you guys are taking notes and hang pause and rewind because there's really a lot to unpack there and to really sit with. The biggest thing that's coming through for me is focus. Yep. And what it sounds like to me is it's the yogic philosophy of sadhana, which teaches us to be in pursuit of in our habits and behaviors and our thoughts and feelings. Yep. A thousand yeah. percent, right? So there's even like a model that I use for me, for my clients, for everybody that I consult, people in my alliance. But I also tell everybody that you have to seed before you weed. And weeds are all the noise that you currently have, right? Like knowing that I'm in the middle of a divorce, right? But we still live together and we're best friends now. And that I just lost my studio. And then the whole business architect is changing and I'm out of that company and there's new ones coming in. Like there is just an unlimited amount of noise that's always going to be there, right? That radio dial exists. But if I wake up in the morning, the first thing I do is go jump into the weeds of my garden 
I've already lost the game for the future because I haven't planted any new seeds, created any new evidence, or done anything intentionally for who I want to be in 30 days or 60 days or 90 days. And so I tell everybody, you have to seed before you eat and you have to earn the right to even touch your business. So I break it down into um, your heart, your mind, your body, and your business, right? And in business, it's really, really easy. I'd recommend the book Clockwork for anybody who's an entrepreneur by Mike Michalowicz. Actually, his entire arsenal of libraries is a PhD in guaranteed success. His books are incredible. But in Clockwork, it's identifying your queen bee role, right? Knowing that these are the three things that if I do them every day are guaranteed to get me my results or a whole lot closer, right? Because Pareto's principle truly takes over when it comes into entrepreneurship. And so when you think about that, those are really easy to find. Like if I don't record podcasts, if I don't get on calls with my clients and I don't create content, I don't have a business, right? There is no business in my world without those. And so it doesn't matter if there's a forest fire in front of me and everything's burning down, like if I don't do those things every day, no matter what's on my plate, I'm basically sacrificing my success in the future by not prioritizing those things. And so those are my needle movers that go in the business part, but you have to earn the right to touch them. And so for me under heart, that's my faith, right? That's my sacred time in the morning where I wake up every morning and I don't set an alarm, bro. Like, I have not set an alarm for years. I hate getting up early, but God decides to wake me up when he wakes me up. And recently it's been at 444 every day mm. for like the last three weeks. And so I literally try to go back to sleep. And then he's like, nope, nope. And so I come up, I walk on my treadmill, I read my scripture or I watch my sermon. And that's me like getting into my heart and choosing who I get to be that day. And I choose three words to describe my state of being. And I'm like, today I'm a loving, passionate, trusting man. Today, I'm an honorable, honest, and hardworking man. And I pick three that I want to embody. And then under my mind, I literally work on my mindset. So I intentionally will journal or speak out affirmations about who I want to be in the future. And then I move my physical body, like to get in my body, like to get in the actual experience of life. And I live in Montana at the base of a mountain. And so as soon as I get off the treadmill, I walk barefoot outside in that frozen grass, which wakes me up really quick. And that I say my affirmations and I feel the earth, I pray to God, and then I come in and do my family time. And so before I even get to my kids, like I've already been awake, I've prayed, I've been outside in nature, I've chosen who I want to be for the day. And then my family time is number one. And then before I check my phone, before I check my email, before I look at anything from my CEO or anything, I come into my office and I do those three needle movers before the world's allowed to touch me because I just protected my garden. Like I planted seeds today that I can harvest the fruit of, you know, 30 days in the future, 60 days in the future. And now I've earned the right to let the world in. But when you let the world in after those things, it's like putting your pads or your armor on before you wake up. But most people, their alarm goes off, right? They start their day with a lie to themselves. Nothing like setting your alarm the night before and then hitting snooze the moment you wake up. Why lie to yourself to start the day? Just set the alarm for nine minutes later or 22 minutes later, right? Like you got to keep your word to yourself, but then they go the Instagram doom scroll, the notification scroll, the text messages and their entire nervous system gets shot. And then they are in their most truest unaltered state, like connected to source, connected to God, whatever you believe in. But like in your, I'm out of sleep, I'm out of rest. And then the world comes in and changes the frequency. And so for me, when I hit my heart, my mind, and my body, it's like me putting my pads on before I get on the football field. And if I gave somebody an option of like, hey, you're going to go play in the NFL today, you have two options. You go in in your pajamas, or you can put pads and a helmet on. Which one are you going to choose? You're going to choose the pads and a helmet, but nobody can put them on for us, right? And so that's how I actually navigate my day. And it's something I started doing four years ago. And it's something I teach in our alliance with all the models that go with it. But it is the number one secret to success for me, my clients, anybody I advise, anybody I consult, because nobody can guarantee success, but you can guarantee a plan that's going to get you there. And one of my mentors, Simon Bowen says, nobody chooses to self-sabotage. We just behave our way into it. And if mm. we don't design our environment or design a plan or put it down on paper, we're going to default to the world dictating who we get to be that day, who we are, how we feel. And we become massively permeable 
And we end up picking up and catching all of these beliefs and feelings and stories that aren't ours. And the only thing it's doing is getting in the way of us planting or harvesting our own garden. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so much there. And earlier you said something about catching thoughts and feelings and you combined it with another word. What was that? Oh, I um, I said probably stories that were either caught or taught that the yeah, world yeah, pours yeah. into us every day. Yeah. I love that. Stories that were caught or taught. I mean, it, there's so much here that it's like pick and choosing and try and be present of, of where, but like that one for me was something that stood out, like stories that are either caught or taught. Like the taught ones we all know, but the caught ones, like that energetic seepage. And I recently went through a, a Reiki training just oh. over the past couple of weeks. And th I've had different energetic like cleansing type of things that I've learned, but it was really cool and Reiki learning some things and just calling our energy back and the intention. But one thing I wanted to pick out off, uh, off of your morning routine, which was excellent. Thank you so much for sharing is in the past four years, I'm sure there's been times when you're off your game. How do you personally get back on your game and what works for your clients best to get back on your game when you're off your game? I love you because you asked the questions that unlock the secrets to the kingdom of like things that I charge people for, but I share it as long as you ask. And I tell everybody, if you stick a quarter in me, you're going to get it. I'm even adjusting in my seat right now. Okay. So, so what I call those, I call those the sacred light keeper quadrants, right? Those four areas for me, right? So for me, my branding is a lighthouse. I believe my job is to be a lighthouse. And my favorite lighthouse quote is lighthouses give light because giving light is its nature. It's not interested in who gets it. And for me, that's the definition of leadership. Everything else creates codependency or it enables people, right? And so I call those the quadrants. Those are the four areas that guarantee that the light keeper can keep the light on every day. Also knowing storms are coming. People are going to vandalize the lighthouse, right? A ship's going to sink. Like there's all this stuff in the world that happens. So I have another model that I call the SOS model. And the SOS model is designed to get you back in the game, right? So... There's three parts to this core model. This is actually what I teach in my Alliance, our $100 a month mastermind. It's the core models that I give everybody, right? These are the first ones that everybody gets. And this is the exact way we do it for all of my clients, whether it's six figures, seven figures, eight figures, it is a requirement for me because I can see it on paper and I'm like, no, here's the plan, right? So you write out the quadrants, okay? The mistake that people make when it comes to quote unquote routines is they get rigid about the routine instead of the outcome. So when I have a behavior, like for me, my morning prayer in my heart is very important. So what I do is I have a model called the wedge of expectations. And so I ask two questions of my clients and I say, great, on your dream day, how much time do you want to spend every single day in your heart, in your mind and in your body? Right. And they're like, oh, 30 minutes of prayer, 30 minutes of mindset, an hour working out. I'm like, amazing. Write that down. That's your ceiling. And I'm like, now I'm going to ask you the hard question. On your worst day, when your wife leaves, your husband leaves, you walk out of the house, your dog gets run over by a car, you're filing bankruptcy, but you look at your kids and you refuse to die and knowing you're not going to quit, what's the minimum you can commit to to protect your progress and ensure you have food to eat in the future? And I make them write the floor. And so for me, with my heart, it's 30 minutes in the morning of faith. My minimum is five minutes in my Bible. For my movement... It's an hour on my treadmill. My minimum is a 10 minute walk outside. For my mindset, it's 30 minutes of work. My minimum is just writing down the three words that I choose to do. And so no matter what, I'm protecting my progress because people overvalue intensity and undervalue consistency, right? And I can give you sports analogies, but base hits win baseball games, running plays win football games. The only reason they swing for home runs and they throw Hail Marys is for entertainment purposes. And that's a whole other podcast on Circus Circus. We'll just leave that one off. But I know Sam and I see the world the same. So we'll just leave that one where it is. So that's the base workout, right? No matter what. And the behaviors that go in that model, they go in that model, not for who you are today. They go in that model for who you want to be in the future. 60 days from now, 90 days from now. What would my day look like if I was a million dollar entrepreneur? What would my day look like if I had a team of five people, right? And this is going to sound like a weird book recommendation, but one of my clients, Catherine Woodward Thomas, wrote a book, Calling in the One, and it's how to attract your dream partner. But that book, it? Calling, calling in, the in the One, Calling in the One, yeah. it is a masterclass on embodiment because she's like, 
oh, you want your dream man to show up, but is there space in your closet for him? How many nightstands are next to your bed? One or two? Is there a place for him to put his shoes? Do you even have enough dishes in the house to feed somebody if they live with you? And what it's really doing is embodying and creating the container because then your behaviors backfill and you act like it's there, which changes your state of being, right? So you want to think about who you want to be at that level or in the future, right? And so that's the base model, right? It's the quadrants and then the floor and ceiling for every behavior. And people don't win because they hit their ceiling every day. People win because they protect their floor every day. And to give a tangible example, like I just lost 110 pounds in the last year because I truly finally found happiness and let it all go. But I've done that 100 pound roller coaster swing four times in my life, right? Like I'm like 160, wow. 165 pounds right now. And the heaviest I've been is 277. And I'm five foot seven, just for the record, right? So if you've ever seen Willy Wonka, I was the purple Oompa Loompa person just blown up and wide as I am tall. And someone's like, yeah, but when you lost it before this time, how'd you do it? And I said, well, I knew I needed to work out again. And I've always been like, I've been a semi-pro athlete. I've competed in many sports at a high level, but then I would lose myself. And so I knew that just getting out of my house was the breakthrough. And so they're like, what did you do? And I was like, well, for 30 days, I said I was getting up at 5 a.m. and going to the gym. And they're like, oh, that's easy. I said, no, no, I didn't say going in the gym. I said going to the gym. And they're like, huh? And I was like, yeah. My ceiling was, I'm going to work out for an hour. My floor was, I just had to park my car in the parking lot and stay for at least 10 minutes. And in that first 30 days, there were seven days that I didn't go in. One day I cried in the car, one day I listened to a podcast, but I protected my progress and the momentum of the habit, not the result of the habit, which kept me consistent. Because if you set yourself up to fail, like, oh, I'm going to work out for an hour a day, you've already lost because you're not. You're going to get sick. Something's going to come up. And then you skip day four. When day five rolls around, you're not like, oh, I'm so excited to go back. You have evidence that you didn't go. And that spiral continues. And that's the accidental self-sabotage. So that's why the floor and ceiling matter. And then the SOS model. And the SOS model is broken up into three buckets. Bucket number one is self-treat. Bucket number two is triage team. And bucket number three is medicine cabinet. So in self-treat, what I have my clients do is I have them list out the five things that reset their nervous system when they're massively stressed, right? So for you, breath, I already know it's breath. Numero uno is breath, right? And I'm like, so I want you to list out the five in order of priority. And so like for me, I use breath, right? Going outside in nature, listening to a favorite song that my son and I have. I have a recording of my own voice in my vivid vision like where I want to be and who I want to be, right? Music, dancing, yelling, screaming, anything. When you've ever been in that moment where you're like, I can't do it anymore. And you finally got so sick and tired and you just went and did something and you felt better, that thing. But the rule is simple. You have to have access to do it immediately wherever you are and it can't be predicated on other people. So like if you're on an airplane, you have to be able to do it. If you're driving in the car, you have to be able to pull over and do it. And so I have them list out one through five in order of priority. Number one, do one round of intranasal breathing or one round of box breathing, right? Number two, listen to my favorite playlist. And I make them list them out in their notes section. And that's what's called self-treat. But there's an important part here. In parentheses next to self-treat, it says set 10-minute timer. Set 10-minute timer. That's the self-treat section. Then you move into your triage team. And your triage team is a minimum of three people and up to nine people who hold you accountable to your potential, but don't believe your story. That is a very, very important part. Hold you accountable to your potential, but don't believe your story, right? So if you called me in meltdown, I'm not interested in the details because I don't have your answer. I'm like, great. Are you done? You want to let this all out? Like, what are we going to do? Right? Like, how are you feeling? What gets in the way? And so I make them list at least three and have up to nine. And then if you have an iPhone, I make you set those nine people as the top nine in your messages on your iPhone, because you also will subconsciously see them 500 times a day. And then the medicine cabinet is any resource, any tool, anything that you might need or supports you that whenever you're triggered or overwhelmed, you forget that you have. A lot of people put their vivid visions in there. They put pictures of their kids in there. 
they do things to remind them and get them grounded again. And so you open the note section on your phone and you write this out. Self-treat, triage team, medicine cabinet. And the rules are simple. With the quadrants, this is your plan that you said, this is what's going to get me results. And nine out of 10 times when somebody's in breakdown or their life happens, it's because they haven't done one of these behaviors that day. Mm. And so if they haven't hit their floor and ceiling and they're in breakdown, they use their SOS. And so the SOS is saved on their phone. It's also set as the background of their phone, environmental design. And so the moment you recognize you are in breakdown, you have to set a 10 minute timer and your job is to get yourself through it because ultimately that's the finish line. Like if you're an Olympic athlete and you have a coach and you get a, sh a flat tire in the bike portion of your race in the Olympics, your coach can't run out there and change your tire. If your shoe comes off, he can't come jump in and give you a new shoe. You're going to have to figure out how to finish the race if you want to win the Olympics, right? Like that's the end goal. And so you set a 10 minute timer, you go through the self treat. And when that timer goes off, if you are not through and back to one of those behaviors, you have to call the first person in the triage team immediately. And you have to say, Hey, I'm in breakdown SOS. And then normally they're either going to send you back to something in that self treat or something into your medicine cabinet and help you get clarity based on your plan or your goals. And so those are the exact three core models that I use. Like, personally with every single one of my one-on-one -on -one clients, everybody in our alliance, and it is genuinely what has saved my life. Wow, George, thank you for sharing that with us. Uh, this has been a masterclass. You know, it was going to be diving into uh, your thoughts, feelings, spiritual state right now, which I would love to transition to here in a moment. But before we do, guys, go to the show notes and ch click that link to check out George's landing page of the Alliance. I was actually looking at it before we hit record and it's amazing to hear you break that down. And you said it's a hundred dollars a month, right? Yeah. It used to be 10 grand a month, bro. And then I closed Whoa. it for two years and, uh, God put it on my heart again and everybody was asking and asking. And then I was like, I don't know. I don't know. And I prayed on it for 30 days. And I just kept praying and praying like, yeah, but what's the price and what's the price? And he just kept saying a hundred bucks. And I was like, All right, okay, okay. And so we reopened it up and it's the best thing I've ever done. Like it's my home and I love it to absolute pieces. But yeah, that was my former mastermind. That was 10 grand a month for all the seven figure entrepreneurs, except now there's 10 times as much models in there. And the first 30 days alone in the Alliance, the track that we have laid out is actually the whole former 12 month curriculum of my seven figure entrepreneur mastermind in the first 30 days. And so, yeah, it's about impact. It's about service. And I genuinely believe in rising tides. And if everybody wins, if you win, I win, but you have to win before I do. And when we can do it collectively for the cup of coffee a day, there's really no reason to not have support, not have community, not have a place to celebrate your wins. Everybody supports each other. Like everybody's been doing launches. And by the time I even get in, they're like, oh, this was the best launch ever. 20 of them came and supported me. They shared it with their audience. They're all like doing business in front of me and my codependency is getting ripped open because I'm like, nobody needs me anymore. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, that's, that's exactly what it is. So, yeah, you know, I, it's funny hearing you talk a lot of the things. There's just so many parallels in my journey, one of which was like how ayahuasca was a start for you. And then you mentioned three year journey for me as well. I was three year journey. I'm on year two coming out of that. And so on two years, five years now, the last two years I've been rebuilding and kind of like what you said, uh, trying different things. That's where I'm at now and trying to figure out what's going to stick and create the processes. And a lot of these questions I'm asking are obviously for myself with my listeners in mind, but being like, wow, I just keep getting stuck myself. That said, there was, oh, what I wanted to say is even just looking at you for the people that are listening and you can't see George, she's wearing a shirt that says relationships beat algorithms. And that has been your tagline or your message for a long time. And it just reminds me of my message, soul life balance so much. It's the archetypal energies of the feminine, masculine, yin, yang, whatever uh, resonates with you, but soul being relationships and algorithms being that masculine or that life, uh, that yang energy. So it's just interesting to see all these parallels and how so 
so many of us are talking about similar things of embodiment of both of these energies just in different ways. You know, I thought that was interesting to call out. One of my one of my favorite I love that and I love that you shared that because I feel like the big secret is understanding that like even with plant medicine, right? Like I'm I have no issue with psychedelics. I love people that use them, but I am psychedelic free for, you know, the last three years and I will be for the rest of my life because there's one finish line in psychedelics and it's integration. And the more you use them and the less you do it, the more you get punished. And it's always only been about integration, right? Like even sitting with Mother Aya 16 times, the drinking of the medicine is literally the first step of an infinity amount of steps as long as you're on this astral plane and this existential meat suit floating around what everybody tries to understand. The rest of it is when you're given those awarenesses, how do you integrate them, right? And, and one of my favorite quotes that was given to me was uh, by a, a beautiful shaman. And he's like, don't say my name because I don't remember who told it to me. But he said, uh, a student says, I already know. And a master says, thanks for the reminder. And so for me, the more of us that talk about this, the more of us that share this, the more of us that help each other share this, the more empowering we are to the world to help people integrate and come into that harmony and come into that alignment of their heart and being present in the moment and not attached to the results like your bank account balance isn't going to be on your headstone like none of it matters right like i've been blessed to have it all lost it all had it all again and gave it all away like bro i went from driving my sports cars and dream cars in california to like i drive a subaru outback wilderness and live in my dream state of montana and i don't need anything else like I have space, I have nature and yeah, I'm still successful, but like none of that other stuff made me successful. It just created lifestyle creep. It just got in the way of what living is, which is presence and moments. And so for me, the more of us that talk about it, the more creative ways we get into sharing it, it, it allows us to reach people uniquely in a way that I can't, right? Because some people don't like my flavor. They don't like the, the mohawk, you know, the tattoos, the marine, the heart centered teddy bear two by four sometimes, right? But everybody's message resonates differently. And I think that's another thing I'd say to every entrepreneur because the other mistake, and just to tie this to earlier, is thinking that it's already too noisy or it's too loud or no one's going to care. Yeah, no. No one sees it like you see it. Nobody can deliver it like you deliver it. It's needed more now than ever. You just have to keep going. And, and here's the thing about visions or about dreams or about anything. If you truly have one, you can't ask anybody else how to build it. It's never been built before. You ask me, you're going to build my vision. That's why I don't consume content. If I consume content, I'm building somebody else's vision. If I create content, I'm building mine. So I even only intentionally consume if I have a challenge. I'm like, oh, I'm going to go find this, or I'm going to go watch this one video to answer this question. But other than that, I'm going to learn a whole lot more by slapping some sticks on my foundation, putting some paint colors up. And at the worst, I don't like the color, so I just repaint it. But I'm not going to go out and ask 100 people what color I should paint my own house. It's never been built before, right? So you yeah. get to make it your own way. And and this brings up a really fascinating esoteric topic. And you and I might have touched on it when you interviewed me. I don't remember. But I've recently really gotten into the subconscious mind, quantum physics, Neville Goddard's work. And one of Neville's books is Feeling is the Secret. Then okay. Tim Grimes uh, co-authored with him, meaning he took his information and re repurposed it uh, into a book called Relax More, Try Less. And Relax More, Try Less blew my mind because last year I had maybe a few months where I made next to nothing. And when I say next to month, nothing, I mean a few months of making less than $3,000 in like three months or something. Mm -hmm. And then when I implemented the relax more, try less uh, practice, that looked like for me getting out to the beach, doing breath work, meditation, cold plunging, finding when I wanted to be in my masculine of doing the salesy things and reframing it and catching myself. Well, when I was able to do that, in about four to five weeks, I brought in $27,000, which is mind blowing. And I've now like keep getting to an energy of gaslighting myself like, oh no, but it's this or that. And like trying to get back. And then I find myself frustrated and like, this isn't working or that's not working and back in the masculine. And then trying to get back to that level of like the state of receiving and being the co-creator of my reality. And I know I'm not alone in this. So this isn't a full on selfish question. I know this is going to resonate with a lot of people. Maybe you believe this, but you don't have like the gnosis of, 
of actually having experienced it and you just are like, oh, but this feels true. What would you say for, for someone that it resonates with this so that they can stop gaslighting themselves and fully relax to receive? Yeah, well, I'll say it the way it was said to me. I had a very, very wise, godly shaman look me dead in the eye and he said, you want to know why you can't win? And I was like, why? And I was yelling at him. Like I was dropping F-bombs. I was pissed. I was like, you're supposed to fix me. That's what I'm here for. And he's like, you can't win because you've never been quiet enough to hear God's whispers. And it broke me. Broke me. And I'm like, oh, you mean when I'm driving in the car and I magically think of Sam, I installed that thought in my brain. Like I was like, oh yeah, when I'm driving in an hour and a half down by a mountain, I want you in 90 minutes to be like, oh, text Sam this one thing, right? Like space is the secret because space is where you belong. It's where you live. It's where your creativity comes from. It's where your ideas come from. But also that space doesn't mean it hits instantly. It means you have to be sacred in it and honor it, but also take care of your vessel and vehicle first, which is what you did. You surfed. You filled your bucket. You spent time in nature, right? For some other people, it's going to go to the library. For other people, it's going to go get their nails done or a massage done, right? Everybody who has a, who's had a massage knows exactly what it's like. You schedule it and then you regret it. Try to justify canceling it because you're like, there's no way I can go for an hour, right? And then you're like, rah, 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 I'm going to go, oh, fine. And then you lay on the table and then you're like, oh my God. I got to remember this. I got to remember this. Oh, when's this going to be over? And then eventually like, oh, there's an idea. There's an idea. Oh, crap. I got to write this. I repeat it. And then eventually you end up in a mushy puddle and you don't remember anything. And you get up off that table feeling so relaxed. And then magically over the next day, every idea that you thought you were going to forget about magically shows right back up with the ingredients needed, right? Our nervous systems are so in fight or flight 24 seven and completely controlled by the world around us. But when you create the space, it's just like your reticular activating system. The information around you didn't change. You just got to see the information at a different level because you tuned your radio dial to where it belonged, which was from a place of alignment. And I was like, oh, what are you talking about? I'm like, all right, cool. If you go buy a red Jeep, you're going to be like, I want this red Jeep. No one has one. The day you buy it, you're going to realize that 75 people that day have the same red Jeep in your town, but you couldn't see it before because your reticular activating system didn't have a frame for it or you hadn't seen it before. That's how your nervous system works, right? And so if you're constantly tilted, gaslighting yourself, looking at everybody else's stuff, reading false evidence, listening to negative music, watching horrible television shows, scrolling through TikTok, like scrolling through Instagram, we're intentionally turning our radio dial into the things that we don't want. And my personal development teacher 12 years ago said this to me. She said, what you resist persists. And I was like, oh, and my dear friend, Sharon Lecter, who wrote Outwitting the Devil for Napoleon Hill, she says, our thoughts mm. wow. dictate our words, which dictate our actions. But here's the funny thing about our thoughts when you're gaslighting yourself, when you're self-deprecating, when you're negotiating with yourself, who are you negotiating with? Like, it's well, you. Yeah, exactly. That's where the IFS work it helps me so much. Oh, for the internal family, a thousand percent yeah. for IFS work, right? Yeah. That's why Gestalt works so well, like Gestalt empty chair process, right? Like even when you put yourself in a different situation, right? Like Gestalt empty chairs, like, you sit in one chair and you talk from your side, but then you state change, go to the other chair and speak from the opposing side, or you release trauma with your mother, but then you go sit in the other chair and you tell the story from your mother's side, right? You're actually mm -hmm. just state changing your brain because Schrodinger's cat theory, right? Everybody believes there's one singular truth, but there's not. Multiple truths can all be true at the same time, but perception is the difference between our power and our prison. And it's really where we choose to turn that radio dial, right? And so if we're self-deprecating, if we're self-gaslighting, the only thing we're actually doing is bringing more evidence in because there's no evidence that you would go to a jury of 12 of your peers to convince them of the thing that you're saying about yourself if your life was on the line. You wouldn't even show up to court. Right. But yet, when we keep it up here or when we allow it to happen, 
we act like it is and we would win that case. And then we wonder why we don't have different results, right? Like you have to change your environment. You have to change your state, but it starts. And this is why I'm so big on alignment. Like if you're unhappy, there's no happiness that comes. Like even if you do do this through faith and you do this through abundance, what's the number one law of abundance? It's to be grateful for everything that you have. Mm -hmm. Because if not, it's scarcity. That doesn't mean, oh, I'm going to complain about this, 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 and this, and then go manifest more of that. No, if you're complaining about that thing, you're only going to get more of that thing. And so it really boils down to being integrous with ourselves in the mirror, but not with fault, blame, guilt, or shame. Because if it wasn't for these things, these behaviors, these thoughts, these paradigms, these wounds, whatever you want to call them, we wouldn't be where we are. And so it's really about having gratitude for them. But I also teach this through Google Maps, right? Because I'm like, they're like, well, what do you mean? I'm like, well, in order to grow, in order to change, you have to have a current state. And they're like, no. And I was like, okay, cool. Open Google Maps on your phone. Go to the destination and type in a destination a thousand miles from you and hit go. What's it say? And it says, choose a starting location. Oh, you mean it can't get you there until it knows where you are? Well, that's mm. what gratitude is. That's mm. what self-awareness is. If you're making where you are wrong or you're refusing to look at where you are, you're actually stopping your own ability to get to somewhere different. And so Thich Nhat Hanh has this incredible quote that I love. And he says, the moment you recognize you are, you no longer are. Yeah. Which means the moment you're like, oh my God, I'm so happy because of this moment that just happened, you're actually no longer happy. You're thinking about how you were happy, but you're aware of it. That's just like, like the what, hardest part. It's so of course it is. Yeah. Of course it, because it's a muscle, right? It's not a yeah. default state. It's a state that has to be chosen. I mean, it's you the, think about- I got it, I lost it phenomena that Adya Shanti talks about, you know? And I got it, I lost it only happens because you're thinking about how you got it instead of just turning around and looking at that you still have it, right? It's yeah. just, it's it's anything up here. This is why mm -hmm. we say the longest distance a human can travel is from their head to their heart. It is the hardest 18 inches in the world mm -hmm. because when you're in your heart, you're present. And that's why breath is such a powerful tool because if you really think about it, the moment you catch yourself self-deprecating, the moment you catch yourself with negative self-talk, you're actually no longer doing it. You're thinking about how you were doing it. Mm -hmm. So in that moment, you have a choice. And the choice is, do I continue and then get more of this? Or would I like to try something else on for size? And it, I mean, like for years, there's podcasts of me. I said cancel 50 times in podcasts. I'd be like, oh, blah, 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 cancel. Because I would self-deprecate. And I would then say cancel out loud. And then what I'd be like, no, no, cancel. Like yeah. I would say thing, I would say things like, oh man, like I'm such a bad dad. And I'd be like, wait, cancel, cancel, cancel. I'm an amazing father. Oh, I see what you mean. So uh, yeah, like what Dr. Joe teaches is say change. Change. You would say cancel. I would yeah. say cancel, right? Got I was it. taught, I was taught cancel 13 okay, years let, ago. Let, let's pause right there. So unpack that for people that are new to this, uh, what that does on a neuroscientific level, what you're doing. Well, there. yeah, that would be, that would be for Jock to do to explain. I will okay, explain I, the marine version, which is the yeah, yeah. colors of crayons version, right? Like what ends up happening is that, you know, our subconscious picks up things. I, I forget the number, but it's multiple thousands of times faster than our conscious brain. Right. So when we basically speak and we speak things that are negative or negative framed about ourselves. It's programming our supercomputer, as Jim Quick says, right? It's writing the program of how we're going to see and be in the world. And everyone gets stuck in this, like, well, how do I change it? How do I change it? I'm like, you actually have to stop it when it happens and change the words, right? And so even when you're in your brain, you're like, oh, I'm such a bad person. I'm such a bad blank. Get out a pen, write on a sticky note, whatever you're saying about yourself, and then cross it off and write a new one. When you catch yourself saying something that isn't for your highest and true, you actually say change, as Dr. Joe says, who's incredible, or cancel, and then you replace it with a new one, right? Just like if you're writing a piece of letter to somebody and you write the wrong word, you can either white it out, you can cross it out, but you still have to write a new one. And that's actually how you do the reprogramming of the brain, but it's a muscle, right? And our brains operate with episodic memory. So when our subconscious is there, if we think about like, I'm 40 years old, right? Like I'd say like, I've been genuinely happy for maybe two years. 
That mm. means I have 38 years of memory programming, of episodic memory that when I get triggered, my entire body and brain is going to default back to that one. It's kind of like when you gain 100 pounds and you decide you want to lose weight, you don't get to go to the gym for one day and magically 100 pounds is gone. You have to consistently rewrite that over and over and over and over again. And our thoughts and our words are the most powerful ones that we ignore. We try to change it from the outside in instead of changing it from the inside out, right? And this is where books like uh, Personality Isn't Permanent by Benjamin Hardy. And my favorite one is Nicole LaPera. She's the holistic psychologist on Instagram, but she wrote a book called How to Do the Work. Mm -hmm. And it's all written through the lens of future self-journaling. But what you're really doing is speaking into existence who you want to be while you're eradicating all those roots and all those anchored and episodic memories and giving yourselves new ones. And so it really, you know, I, I say to clients all the time, like we aren't what we do, we're what we tolerate. And mm -hmm. for me, I can't tolerate being mean to myself because I know the results that come. And so even if I'm on a podcast, like I've been on stage in front of 5,000 people wow. and I was given a keynote and I was talking about business and I literally said, and yeah, and this made two and a half million dollars. And then I was like, wait, stop. And I sat on the stage and I cried and I didn't tell anybody why. And then I stood up and I said, I'm so sorry. That was for my ego and it didn't serve any of you. What I meant to say was, and I didn't care that they were there. I, it wasn't for them. It was for me, like my sobriety, like my integrity. But it's really that muscle and the standards that we hold for ourselves, right? And I had a shaman do this to me too. He's like, you have a kid, right? And I was like, well, yeah, my, my wife's eight months pregnant. And he's like, would you ever say out loud to your kid the things that you say about yourself in your head? And I was like, uh-uh, uh-uh. And he's like, great. He's like, I want you to find a photo of yourself when you were three to five years old. And I want to set, I want you to set it as the background of your iPhone. And he's like, you can take it off when you stop talking negatively about yourself. But whenever you choose to be negative, I want you to look at that photo and I want you to say it out loud to that five-year-old version of yourself. Mm. And that one didn't work so well for me. So I made it better. Mm. And so when I did that, I made a rule that when I did it, I had to record it on video. And so I would open the video and I'd be like, George, you're such a horrible blank, 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 blank. And normally I couldn't even continue. But the rule was when I was done, I had to send it to five people who I knew loved me. Damn. It was gone in a week. In a week. Like, can you imagine being married and texting your wife 17 times a day? How horrible of a person you are in video form. I couldn't do it anymore. So for the steps here, because this is, I've never heard anything like this and I love it so much. So you put a picture of yourself as a child. And then anytime you have a negative thought or like self-limiting belief, you're taking a video of what it is, saying it out loud, and then you send it to five people and oh, you keep I, doing that uh -huh. until you don't have the negative beliefs coming through anymore. Uh huh. Because yeah. you don't want to send the video to other people, let alone do the video for your self so it, wow that is powerful yeah yeah That's i don't dope. i don't i don't like the i don't like the long road i like i like the short, <laughs> yeah, 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 i like cool. i like the short road right but if you think about it in like the competence matrix right in the beginning we're unconsciously incompetent a lot of times we don't realize we're doing it right but even after listening to this podcast there's going to be people that start to recognize they're now doing it way more than they realize but now they have an awareness of it right so then you go from unconsciously incompetent to consciously incompetent, meaning you have an awareness of it, but you don't have the behavior. Mm -hmm. So then you have to choose to become consciously incompetent, right? Like I'm aware, I'm doing it, I'm changing a behavior. And then when you do it enough, you become consciously incompetent, which means it becomes a subconscious pattern and it rewrites itself, right? And so the way that I teach this, and this just happened at an event, when I do my events, people like to call me out and I'm totally open for all the feedback, but I said the word irregardless. And someone's like, you know that irregardless and regardless mean the same thing? And I'm like, no, I didn't know that. And then I was like, do I say irregardless a lot? And all 70 hands went up instantly. <laughs> and dude, and I was like, wait, screw all of you. None <laughs> of you have told me this. They're, I'm like, where? They're like, your podcast, your social. And I was like, 
thanks guys. Like, thanks for looking out. Right. And I was like, I'll show you how I get rid of this. And so over the course of two days of the event, I now had an awareness that I was saying irregardless. And so then I'd be speaking and I'd be like, oh, irregard, oh crap. And I'd say it. And then I would say cancel regardless. And then a few times it would slip and someone would be like, you said it. I'm like, oh. And so by day two, when I was speaking, I would go and I would catch it before the word came out. And I'd be like, oh man, ir- oh, regardless. And right. then by day three, I was catching it before my mouth happened and then it was gone. And it was gone within three days. And I also gave up swearing. I gave up swearing six weeks ago and I've been swearing my whole life. Like I was a Marine and everything. And I was like, why? I'm like, because I feel like it shows that I don't want to learn other words and I don't want to be received that way. But I have moms that listen to my podcast with kids in the car. I have people who don't hear my message because of the words that I choose to hear or choose to use. Right. And they're like, okay, cool. And so it took me about two weeks to completely remove swearing from literally being a Marine for 13 years and speaking in cusses like constantly. But it was the same thing. Once I brought it to my awareness that I didn't want to do it anymore, I now had a frame. And so when I would catch it, it just basically, I explained it. I'm like, it's like 10 feet outside of my mouth. Then it's five feet out and then three feet out, then a foot out. Then I catch it in my mouth and then I catch it before it gets to my mouth. And then eventually it doesn't even come into the ecosystem anymore. Another, uh, I love all of those. One I'll share with you because I know you'll get a kick out of this having such a big heart is I took hate out of my dialect a few years ago and it was pretty easy for me to replace it with strongly dislike, uh, you know. Mm-hmm. Anytime I want to say hate, I feel that coming on. I'm like, okay, strongly dislike because I'm not putting that energy within me or anyone else. I want to go back to something you said earlier about what you resist persists. You know, this is a very common saying that we've all heard. And I think for me, like that was a big core theme of my first night of ayahuasca. But something that came in a few years ago, which I'd be curious if you've ever heard this before, because I'm not sure um, people really talk about it, but it's very simple. It's the reverse or the inverse. I'm not sure what's correct there of that saying, which would be what you persist resists. Oh, man, I might have to meditate on that one. What okay. you. OK, okay. So what so, you so, persist resists. Yes. So this one came through for me during my yoga teacher training in Costa Rica in 2021. And it was around the concept of sadhana and everything I was talking about earlier about my energy last year of like trying to do all the things in business and I'm persisting it, but I'm coming from an energy of need, right? That's that persistence. Whereas instead of persisting and pushing it away from attracting and receiving it, right? So what you persist, resist. And I've never really asked anyone like, hey, is that like a common saying? Because I know it's a common saying of saying like, what you resist, persist. And you'd think that like, someone would have pointed that out, but like no one really says that, that I've noticed. And for me, like in terms of the gas gaslighting and where I get stuck, it's always because I'm persisting and I'm in my masculine so hard. I'm so out of balance and it's being, it's a resistance. It's not coming in. Yeah. That's interesting. Cause when you said it, what I heard, what I heard is what you persist creates resistance, but a good resistance like a muscle resistance. Like if I go to the gym and I lift weights and I don't feel it, I'm not actually getting stronger. I'm atrophying, right? And and that's growth for me. And so when I heard it on the inverse, I'm like, well, yeah, when I'm persisting in something, I'm growing. I want to be stretching. I want to be growing. I want to be getting stronger, right? I think the trap that we fall into is when we fall into linear to-dos instead of outcomes, right? And I think that that's one of the biggest gaps that entrepreneurs fall into is they get attached to what it looks like rather than the progress that that's being made, right? And uh, Dan Hardy, uh, no, Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan have an incredible book on this. It's Dan Sullivan's concept, right? The gap in the gain, but it was co-authored and Benjamin Hardy wrote it. But we fall into that trap where we're making progress or building something, right? And then all we see is this massive gap ahead of us. Mm -hmm. But if we actually stopped for one minute and turned around and looked at how much we gained and focused on how much we gained, the next steps seem a whole lot easier and a whole lot clearer, right? But also understanding that in the world of business, like business itself is masculine, right? The structure of business is masculine, right? It it has to be. And 
my definition of masculine is strong back, soft front. I got that from John Wineland, right? But what it is, is the masculine creates bumpers on the bowling alley to allow the feminine to feel with reckless abandon, knowing it's being held, which also means my feelings. And so that's why I get to keep structure with my routines and with my processes, but they're not rigid, meaning I have a floor and a ceiling. But I always have to have some semblance of an outcome knowing that I have to be growing. I have to be doing things different, right? And if I wake up every day and I joke with people, if I wake up every day and everything feels easy, my job is to drive my car into the wall as fast as possible and create some check engine lights because that's atrophy, right? Like there's no such thing. Like if I go to the gym every day for 10 days and I go through the motions and I'm never sore, or I don't feel it, or nothing hurts, or my heart rate doesn't get up, I need to check that because I'm going to get stronger, right? And in entrepreneurship, you can use revenue, right? You're not going to magically manifest your way to a $10 million business. It's a workout. It's a gym, right? It's coaching or as a facilitator, right? Like even as a facilitator, a breathwork facilitator, okay. think about how much more capacity you have now than you did in the beginning or when you would facilitate breathwork. And you would feel everybody's energy because they're like releasing inner child stuff, walking their wounds back. And then you'd come home and have to purge for days. And you didn't know that that wasn't yours, that you picked up somebody else's energy. But now the more awareness you have and the more you do it, you're like, everybody let go of your inner trauma. Screw it. We out here, like we're just doing sacred surgery, right? But that's because your capacity increases because of what you're focusing on. Like that's your gym. And so when you said it to me, I was like, oh, the inverse of that. Yeah, like when I persist in this thing, there's going to be resistance because that resistance and that force is what's going to make me stronger. The only time I think we lose is when we keep blinders on and think that we can bull our way through it instead of just focusing on the outcome and the progress. Meaning it's really cool to be like, oh, I'm going to do a launch and I'm going to make a hundred grand. That's what most entrepreneurs do. They make 80 and they're like, oh, it failed. They throw the whole thing out and start again. And I'm like, but wait, bro, you made 80 more grand that you were ever going to make. Some of that worked. Some of it didn't. So what worked? What didn't work? What am I going to do differently next time? Right? Like if you go cook a recipe and you put too much or not enough of an ingredient in it and you pull it out of the oven and taste it. You don't quit cooking for the rest of your life and then everybody starves. You're like, oh crap, dinner has to be served. Let me add a pinch of this. Let me remake it real quick and put it back in the oven. Like yeah. that's entrepreneurship. But we I, think I there's that. this one and done. Yeah, I love the analogy of cooking. And I really want to get into cooking, but we're we're not gonna have time for that. You know, when we first hit record, I was sitting here thinking, oh, we're going to talk about your re recent baptism and you know, God calling the phone and you know, just seeing where the conversation goes. And this is what needed to come out. And what's really beautiful about this conversation that we've had is it's in the details it's in the weeds of how you've been able to thrive uh, despite the noise and the chaos we can do something and say like oh we're going to record a podcast about like the chaos and the noise and when god picks up the phone you gotta answer you know but instead of even like saying that's what we're talking about like we just put the intention out there and you gave us the formula for how we can respond in real time to actually answer the call and thrive in the chaos and the noise. So I think that's awesome. I and think thank you I think so it much. lands perfectly exactly where it was supposed to. And this is what God put in my heart. And bro, I got to give you credit because you ask me questions nobody does. And I'm like, normally nobody gets to hear those things because nobody asks. And I'm like, no, no, I charge money for those. But if you ask me, I'm going to tell you. So here, like go, like go win. Like I mean it, like yeah. those are the exact models. I have seven figure clients, eight figure clients, nine figure clients. I give them all. It is a requirement that each one uses those and makes those because those are what I use and I know they work. And so you asked and I'm like, thank you for asking, bro. Like, thank you for asking. Thank you for sharing with us. And guys, definitely, I would encourage, I, this is going to be one I go back to and listen and take notes myself. You know, there's only a few podcasts these days, at least, where I go back and listen to an interview I've done. And I thought I got better at like hearing my own voice because, you know, I've been I've had over like 500 podcasts, but it still comes back now where I'm listening and be like, oh, man.
And I could have, but there's the cancel, the change in real time and another opportunity. So I will definitely be listening to this one. If you are listening and you want to learn more about George, all the links to connect with him on Instagram, his website, and the Alliance, which is the $100 a month community. It's really a community more than anything else is all in the show notes and feel free to reach out to me and I'll give you a Google document with my notes my personal notes that are not out there for the public of what the key takeaways were for me. So George, thank you. Thank you, brother, so much for taking the time to be on this pod and for how you show up in the world. Thanks, brother. It was an honor. And for everybody listening, thank you for giving us the one gift I can't give back to you, which is time. So I don't take it lightly. And so I wish you a blessed day.